Tia Fuller. Oh my gosh. I am so happy to have you on the Everything Saxophone podcast. Thank you. I know you're so busy. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Donna. I look forward to this conversation. Cool. Now, listen, I know you've probably talked a lot about your background and that kind of thing, but it's impressive. I've got to say (laughs) the fact that you started piano at a very young age. I actually want the podcast listeners to, you know, um, they may not have heard some of the other interviews that I've heard. So if you wouldn't mind, can you tell us like, when did you first start getting involved in music? And when did you first start getting involved with playing the saxophone? Sure. Yeah, I am. So of course, I come from a family of musicians. And um, I say, of course, because um, that that's really my foundation. And um, ever since I was young, I remember hearing my, my parents playing music and rehearsing in the basement of our house. I'm from Aurora, Colorado. Um, and my mom is a vocalist and my dad, um, he's a bassist. And um, at the time, my sister is older, but this is like when I was three years old. So I, we would hear them rehearsing or, you know, as a kindergarten or elementary school uh, child, and I'd be out, we'd be outside playing kickball and my, our parents on on the weekends would be either rehearsing or gigging because they also were um, uh, educators in the Denver Public School District. And so and they retired both as administrators as well. So um, growing up in a household of not only educators, but musicians, our, our household was constantly full of life. And um, so, um, so starting off, I started playing piano when I was three and after, <laughs> and well, it wasn't, it wasn't much. I was only three and, I, oh gosh, God bless my piano teacher, Miss Purse. Um, she's passed on now, but she had, she had the patience of Job and, um, I flunked that book from like age three to probably age seven. <laughs> and I stayed there. My mom was like, you're going to stick with the piano. Cause my sister is Shami Fuller Royston, who is the piano player now. But, um, she's she's the one who stuck with it um but we were taking piano lessons and all the way um until i was about nine years old then i picked up the flute i continued playing piano until about 12 and then i picked up the saxophone and it actually was a little bit earlier it was 11 years old so from that point um i started playing in the saxophone in middle school band and jazz ensemble um I remember the first solo I played, it was, uh, I was so excited. It, I can't even remember the name of it, but I remember it had this wee, wee, it's a little doo, 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 something like that. And I liked the, the, the grace notes in it because, you know, in classical music, I was playing flute and concert band at the time, but it just seemed so cool that I could add some grace notes. <laughs> so yeah, but all throughout middle school um, and then high school, I was in marching band, um, but I played, I played saxophone the first year, and then I was a reform woodwind woodwind player who shifted to the um, drum line from my sophomore to senior year in in high school. So after graduating high school, I had played drums, um, the quads in marching band. Uh, I had played flute in concert and symphonic band, and then I played saxophone and jazz band. And, uh, and then I was a pom-pom for one year, but then, <laughs> all of that to lead me to, to college and um, where I was very intentional about studying music and about um, wanting to pursue saxophone and to be a, at the time, just to be a professional saxophone player with my emphasis on jazz. Okay. All right. I've got to unpack a whole bunch of things. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> for first thing, you're playing piano at three years old. So your teacher you were it, it was almost like a, a um a traditional way of teaching piano where it was like we're gonna do the hand in studies or we're gonna be reading out of a book nothing by ear at all no no it was it was straight classical it was classical um study and uh and every now and then i would get on the piano and try to play something but again that was my sister's forte like she was really passionate about the piano to where uh there would be commercials that we would listen to and and then she'd run to the piano with so much excitement and then play but that wasn't me that wasn't me on the piano i think once i got to the saxophone 
and a little bit the flute i was trying to figure some things out by ear but it was mainly reading so my my training and like my musical training and basic theory and reading notes all came thank god from the piano okay so i i'm wondering do you think that um uh because gosh, three years old being able to do that, holy cow. <laughs> um, but do you think that maybe at that time from three to seven that you would have, I'm wondering if you were, a, I've got my keyboard right here, if you were <laughs> able to play stuff by ear and just like figure out songs and stuff, do you think that you would have, you know, been more interested in piano and, and uh, not necessarily pursued it, but you know, it would have been more interesting for you? Potentially. That's a, that's a great question. I, um, I think that in the household that I was in, you know, we were listening, my dad would be piping music all of the time. And so he had somehow had the wire, like the radio station from the basement wired to all three levels of our house. <laughs> and so with big speakers. So I think um, with that, the music was always accessible. But for me, I just didn't, I wasn't inspired. I think when I looked at the piano, it felt more like um, a study of uh, like technical study and it wasn't go ahead and just play what you think or what you feel. And I, and I, I even until this day, I feel a disconnect with the piano, which is horrible for me to say, because I mean, I, I write from the piano and I can play a little bit, but um, it's never been, it's never been my voice. And you know, from a very early age, I felt like it was just too much happening all at once with my right hand and my left hand uh, with simultaneous, you know, playing different chords. And so it was just always, always a lot for me. So, yeah, I, I just feel like it wasn't my voice. Like it was like work for you. That That's the reason yeah. why I'm asking that because, yeah. you know, you're, a ja you're an incredible jazz musician. And I was just thinking, I'm wondering if you were even given any opportunities to, you know, like I'm wondering how you were able to build your ears. Do you know what I'm saying? Cause it, like your training sounds like mine in the sense that, okay, here's the breeze easy book. Okay, here's your trumpet. And then what you're gonna do, here's yeah. lesson one. Okay, here's how you blow, <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That is, I think, I don't know. I think it, from an early age, it was, um, it did feel like work. The piano did feel like work. And for some reason, once I was able to blow into an instrument, for me, that was a direct connection. When I blew into the flute, I was like, okay, I, I feel con interconnected with this external thing, this external piece of metal. And then once I got to the saxophone, it was a done deal because I felt like I'm woman, hear me roar. I can play low, I can play loud. Not, you know, not all of my, or not half of my air is escaping the instrument, like on the flute. So I could like, oh, I could back up. and. So I, I think it was just that direct connection of kind of taking authority and, and not really worrying about multiple things at once. It was like, you know, for the most part, single note fingerings, you know, until you get into the altissimo register, which was a little bit later. But I was able to focus on each and every note that I was playing and that I had connected to. You know, what's interesting, um, you mentioned like that connection, right? And and I, I always say this, and it's true, um, I think. I've taught a lot of people that have played string instruments or piano or even drums first, like brass and woodwinds, mm -hmm. and they always have the hardest time with articulation, you know, mm -hmm. especially piano players and string players, because it's like they get the pluck or they press the finger down. They don't get the, t -t -t -t, you know, they don't get the, the whole how to use your tongue and that kind of thing. And, and the big advantage we have is what we can do with articulation yeah. that they, they can't do. That's right, that's right. The different nuances that we're able to access from a staccato note, but then staccato legato and playing pianissimo or staccato playing loud and really having that intuitive connection to each and every note, which I really, I, I love until this day. Um, of playing the saxophone that anytime I get to my instrument, I'm like, oh yeah, I can, I, I can feel it without it actually being in my hands. I can feel the connection. It's almost like, I guess it's almost like having a baby. I've never had a child before, but knowing that that thing has kind of come from you, that child has come from you because you've cultivated and nurtured and um, same thing with the saxophone. And that's the, that's the first time I've made that 
analogy to a baby, but I think it's just over a period of time. Well, instinctively, that's what was happening in the beginning. But now over a period of time, I've, I've developed this relationship with it that even in its absence, I can feel it and I can still connect to the, to the resonance of it or to the, you know, to the joy or to, even if there's leaks in my horn, like I can, I can connect to that and say, okay, I, I need to get these fixed, but let me try to make something of it. Yeah. And, you know, again, that word connection too. Um, I, I'm really curious. You mentioned the word nurturing and cultivating. When did you take any, um, I'm going to assume alto sax was your first saxophone? Yeah, it was. Okay. But then I, after, shortly after that, I got a soprano. Okay. Got it. Okay. Cause uh, yeah, I'm just thinking like marching band tenor is kind of a pain in the neck, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, in terms of nurturing and cultivating and stuff, did you take private lessons with a saxophone teacher? Um, and if you did, like, what were some of the things that you worked on, you know, in your early years in terms of, you know, like, um, was there anything that stood out if you studied with a teacher that, you know, stuck with you in terms of tone production or in terms of, hmm. you know, improvisation or whatever? That's great. Um, it's so funny. This is a, a bit of a sidebar and selfless promotion, but it's leading to the answer to your question is, so I just got off a Zoom call with this new collective group. It's going to be a subscription for saxophone players called the Sax Loft. And um, it's myself, it's Kirk Whalem, and it's Jeff Coffin. It's also Boston Sax Shop. And um, Max Abrams, who is another great saxophone player, he's like the managing director. And we're putting together a subscription for saxophonists of all different levels. And it's going to be hundreds of videos and um, Zoom hangs and master classes. So I'm saying this because we're constructing the website right now. And we've all done these hundreds of videos. And we're trying to figure out how to categorize them. And it really brought me back in our conversation. I'm like, okay, we're all talking about how, you know, playing long tones or playing scales then lends itself and attaches itself to playing technique and making sure you could get through the horn and then improvisation and then, you know. So um, I'm saying that to say, um, just having been in that meeting, I think, and having to revisit how I learned, I actually, I remember having one private lesson um, maybe not one, but I, it was like a couple of private lessons with an individual that I can't even remember what his name was. Um, and that was very in the, like in the very beginning. Cause when I told my dad, I want to play the saxophone. Um, and I specifically just remember learning basic etudes out of, um, the, one of the saxophone method books, which was cool. But then um, my sister at the time, she was older and it was one of her friends in high school. Um, he gave me a, a couple of lessons. And to me, it was those lessons that stuck. His name is Jeff Gallegos. He's still a saxophonist. I think he lives in Seattle, Washington or somewhere out there. But, um, and I remember us listening in particular to uh, Charlie Parker and we listened to Cannibal Adderley. And he was like, okay. And he, he had me to, to assess and say, okay, which one do you like? And I was like, well, I mean, I've heard them both, I think, but I, I like, I like both of them. And he was like, so what's the difference between the two? And I was like, oh, okay. They're both, you know, playing saxophone, of course. And I could hear the sound, but I wasn't able to articulate. And he was like, well, the way that I think about it is Cannibal Adderley is like going to church. Um, Charlie Parker, Charlie Parker is like, um, oh, I can't remember the analogy. It wasn't going to church, but it was basically Cannibal Adderley was like Charlie Parker, but going to church where Charlie Parker was the foundation. And I specifically, that stuck because every time from that point forward, when I listened to Cannibal Adderley, I was like, oh, he's doing some other soulful stuff that... Maybe Charlie Parker was doing, but he's really he's he's really um, emphasizing it. So when I when I you know in recollection when I'm thinking about my first lessons, I think my first lesson that really made an imprint. And then from that he hit me to this um, improvis patterns for it's a yellow and black book patterns. 
for Improvisation by Oliver Nelson. And, um, and I remember there was one line, I was trying to recall it. Um, uh, I can't remember it, but it was one line in there that I play until this day. And I can't remember, but I learned it around that time of being introduced. So I think that was my immediate connection to, to the enjoyment of playing music and really just trying to play stuff by ear. Um, was, was listening to Cannibal Adderley and really trying to, you know, emulate him in whatever way. Um, another thing that I used to do, and I'm sorry for being so long-winded. <laughs> no, no, this is great. But um, another thing that I used to do, so because my mom is a jazz vocalist, um, of course we had our cassette tapes and I had my little rainbow colored um, canopy bed. But whenever they were in the basement rehearsing, I would take my cassette tape out and I would be singing in the cassette tape, like all of the songs that, just because she sung them all the time around the house, like the autumn leaves, the window, the autumn leaves. And I'm realizing that throughout time, I've tried to connect, or that was like my first time really connecting melody to myself. And then I would, then I would, um, play it into the saxophone. I would transfer it into the saxophone. So again, it all goes back to how it was resonating within me. And then being able to articulate that and encompass that into my, my instrument or through my instrument. This is this is great. So what you're you're kind of saying um, a couple of things. Number one, Cannibal Adderley was a huge influence. And yes. especially uh, this, this uh, high school friend who actually, you know, brought that to, to light. But also, you're kind of referring to as well, like, you know, hearing your mom sing all these like standards and stuff like that, you you really keyed in on the melody, but the importance of singing, I'm wondering the importance of singing, how much that is for you. You know what? And that that's a great question or comment, but I think it's the importance. I didn't realize what I was doing at the time. And I think the to vocalize is what we're all trying to do. And the thing is, I'm having to assess myself because, okay, here I've been playing professionally for a while, but now I'm kind of having to backtrack, especially with this the sax loft um, of like, where did I start from? And I'm realizing that there always has to be a vocal element of pronouncing certain syllables. So like, um, there's a video that I did um, called for long tones and this was later, but I still apply it till today. And it was like when I was in my mid twenties, I had a um, I had a lesson with Professor William Fielder, who's a trumpet player. But he was talking about O oh and Ho. Yep. And then a couple of years earlier, actually, it was around that time. I remember talking to um, Bruce Williams, and he was like, "Make sure you're vocalizing Ah. If you vocalize Ah, it's going to allow your mouth to to have the shape of a church door." You want this open, but then a very solid basis or foundation. So all of these concepts of vocalizing so that when I get to the instrument, I'm able to encompass, you know, the, um, I'm, I'm able to encompass and connect to how I would sing it. And so now, you know, and, um, I'm taking it a point to to now sing on my sets at least one song, and it's really to pay homage to my mom because she had a she's not able to sing anymore. She had a stroke. Oh, um, so but <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm I'm saying all of this to say I'm thankful, but I think it's important for all of us as musicians to go back to that that internal instrument that that we first have because that's going to be our our directive to these um other instruments that hopefully become an extension of us yeah you know what's interesting about that too um i studied classical trumpet and my trumpet teacher would say listen to classical vocalists like uc burling um i would listen to um oh gosh uh jesse norman mm -hmm. um i would listen to the opera singers and you know how they how they were so resonant and he said you know it's funny when we play our instruments, we want to be like singers. Yep. But yet singers, when want to they be sing, like what? They, yeah, they want to be like That's instrumentalists. It. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, to me, that concept is universal because even when I'm teaching I, at Berkeley and I, I teach multiple ensembles. So I always tell the rhythm section, rhythm section, play the melody. 
melodic instruments like horns, I want you to play the rhythm. And through that, you're going to have this intersection of the two. Um, but I think just thinking about it from, from that core basis or the opposite of is going to allow us to um, really cre create more of of a connection to 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 our voice and to ourself and to the idea, you know, no matter how how vast it may be. Yeah, for sure. And and, and you know, I'm I'm glad that I'm I'm asking some of these questions because it's uh it's tying into and I was going to ask about this later, but let's talk a little bit more about the Saturn okay. loft. I saw the ads on on Facebook and oh, okay. um, yeah, which is really awesome. So talk a little bit more about that. And I don't know if you have dates the, where it's going to go live yet. Oh, um, well, we're still figuring out when we're going to launch. It's going to be very soon, probably within the next month or so. But um, you can go to thesaxloft.com. That's um, T-H-E-S-A-X-L-O-F-T.com. And if you go there, uh, it's going to basically give you a little synopsis of um uh, what the sax loft is about and then you can also sign up to um the mailing list and the mailing list will allow you to become a part of this portal that will inform you when we have our i don't want to say meetings but our sax hangs our zoom hangs and um and then any other thing it'll also keep you updated as to when we're releasing launching and any other pertinent news but um I'm really excited. All of us are really, really excited because it's not just us sitting up there talking about this is how you play the saxophone, but you're hearing different philosophies behind how to approach the saxophone or what about the business of music or, you know, long tones, different warm ups. Um, and then we also have with Jack Finucane there with Sax Loft, he's, he's speaking about the analytics behind the saxophone, saxophone construction, maintenance, and, and everything beyond that. So you're getting the holistic approach of the saxophone. And it doesn't even have to be saxophone, actually. I think anyone can join because we're talking beyond what the saxophone has. It's, it's yeah, we're dealing with certain equipment and gear, but then we're also dealing with different concepts that that's, can be transferable to any instrument. Sure, music business, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Now, I, I'm curious, how did you, who came up with the idea first? How did you, how did you decide between the three of you? Were you on a gig? Like, what happened? No, actually, it was Jeff Coffin. This is Jeff Coffin's baby, who Got actually it. is right in the. Um, he started back rehearsals with Dave Matthews Band, yeah, and yeah. Um, and he reached out to us. And again, this is a, a silver lining that um, the pandemic had to offer. And which is really a blessing because I think we were all trying to figure out different ways to connect, you know, and to collaborate. I did so many collaborations, recordings. But he came to all of us. He was like, man, you know, I was thinking about different individuals. And I'm thinking about this, um, the sax loft idea. And he explained it. And he said that he was inspired by, um, there's another subscription-based website that is uh, led by Victor Wooten and Steve Bailey. And it's called The Bass Vault. And so it's a branch, I don't want to say a branch, but it was inspired by that website. And so we're pretty much going to do that in the saxophone community. And it's just, it's really extraordinary. I mean, I, I, I pray that, um, that it serves um, a healing purpose and also informative purposes. Because to me, this is the new wave or an expanded wave of education. I don't want to say anything replaces being in a room with a teacher or, you know, especially since uh, we were teaching online. But um, but this is another way that for those um, who want to learn how to play the saxophone, they can come in and no matter what level, if they're, you know, older, if they're younger, they could come in at the beginner's level, at the intermediate level or at the advanced level. And, um, and we've described all of those levels as foundation, elevation, and innovation. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so it's not, we're not demeaning anybody, but everyone's at different levels. We all are, me, myself, Jeff Coffin, um, Kirk Whalem, and it's like, okay, wherever you come in, we will meet you and give you what you need. That's awesome. This, this sounds like a fantastic project. And, you know, um, you said, uh, I was going to actually ask this also, but I know Jeff Coffin definitely was innovative during the pandemic. 
um, a bunch of people were because um, you had to be because all the tours stopped, right? That's right. So, so let me let me take a right field moment here for a second. How did you adapt during the pandemic time? Like, you know, because you know you, you couldn't tour, all that kind of thing. What happened for you? Yeah, um, you know, <laughs> for the first time in almost twenty years, it was a bit of an exhale because I was able to be at home and I was able to be in the comforts of my house and, and sleep in my bed um, without, you know, going out of town and jumping on a plane every weekend. So that part of it was really enlightening for me because it allowed for me to be still. Now, although I was, um, although I was, we all miss playing. Um, I really tried to sink my teeth into the stillness of the pandemic. And, um, and then also throughout the school year, really, I mean, I was teaching online, but I was having to really reconstruct and reinvent certain ways of teaching because I, I, I wasn't proficient in logic or any of the digital audio workstations. Uh, but now, I'm learning, I've learned a little more and, you know, I can, <laughs> I have my own little studio in here with my small little recording device that I did not have before. So it really, I think it propelled me and many of us to step outside of our comfort zone and to expand in ways that we never thought or the ways that we wanted to, but we never took the time out to. Um, so that was really extraordinary. Um, and then, of course, collaborations. I've done a lot of um, recordings. I did one with, with John Beasley in um, an orchestra, this arrangement of Summertime that I think he's premiering at the Charlie Parker Jazz Festival at the Hollywood Bowl this year. But it, um, so doing that, a number of different recordings, um, videos, um, the sax loft, and I've also started, um, oh gosh, I've also continued to like direct and um, and then also writing for my next album. Okay. Um, so it's it served as a great hub for me to exhale and then also to kind of reinvent myself, for lack of a better term, and and work on a lot of my weaknesses. Okay, so now do you think that all the things that you've done during the pandemic, now that things are opening up, yeah, right, you're going to be starting to probably take touring gigs and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Do you think that, how do I want to word this? Um, having that stillness, are you going to be able to, I don't know if you can, try to incorporate that as you mo move forward? <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. So I went out of town two weeks ago uh, to Nashville and it was so odd because I was, it was almost like a tour. I was going to New Jersey first. Oh, I also got a puppy. Oh, okay. like, I mean, it was sleeping, but um, during the pandemic. But um, so I was going out of town, I'm packing his stuff because I'm a, like a bona fide puppy mom. And um, <laughs> then I'm packing my stuff. And then I'm going out of town trying to get my gig attire, you know, ready, which I haven't really tapped into for about a year now. <laughs> you know, shoes, heels, makeup, like all that. And um, I just felt overwhelmed. I was like, I'm out of practice. I'm really out of practice. So even um, getting to Nashville and I got there and usually I had the energy to get on the flight early in the morning, get off the flight, check into the hotel and then go to lobby call and do a sound check. Like I got off of that plane and I was so wiped out. And I'm just like, I'm out of practice. Like, I I, I'm, I need to get back in the shed of just traveling. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that's age over the year, but it, I can definitely feel a difference of, um, of the energy that I had before and just being out of the whole regiment of packing, thinking, you know, multidimensionally as to what I got to bring for this and this and this. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been a bit of a struggle. Um, and you know, I don't know, and I don't want to jinx myself because I'm, I'm so thankful for work and I love playing and I do like traveling, but, um, I don't know if I wanted to return to what it was like, if, if I were able, as far as me being gone as much, but, um, 
I'm praying that all of these other collaborations and things that I've kind of sunk my teeth into during the pandemic will be able to offset and I'll be able to be a little bit more, um, I'll be able to be a little more choosy. What is the word? Not choosy, but picky. just particular. Yeah, picky um, as far as what I want to take. Because now I feel like I'm just getting to an age to where it's like, okay, I want to do what I want to do, but I, I don't, I don't want to do the stuff that I don't want to do. Because now I have to find a puppy sitter. That's my excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's my baby <laughs> but yeah yeah so yeah I, I think I'm thankful it's just it's definitely been a shift and ironically enough I've talked to a couple friends and they're like yeah they feel the same way I was talking to one of my best friends Warren Wolf who's a great vibraphonist and we were just talking today and he's like man I you know I, he's a little bit younger than me but he was like when I hit 45 Hey, I'm, I'm telling people that they can't ask me to bring my vibraphone anymore because they see me and I'm walking around with big old, you know, muscles. And he's like, but I'm not doing this anymore because I'm getting old. I can't do this. And it's just, I think it's, it's self-preservation. Looking at this life and seeing, okay, we've been doing this for this amount of time. How can we now preserve self and still continue, you know, to maintain in certain areas? Yeah but then kind of relinquish in others. Yeah, um, no, this is this is great that you're sharing this because uh, it's not just musicians that are feeling this, like you, you're also seeing this across the board in many industries where people are not, they're not actually wanting to return physically to work. They'd rather stay home, work remotely. Yeah. It's gonna change the, the working landscape, at least in our country, um, I'm not sure about other countries. I'm, yeah. I'm sure it's probably pretty similar, but. Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, let me ask you this so people get some kind of context. What was your, what was your life like before the pandemic? Like, what was your typical day or week like? Oh, it was exhausting. Um, so I would teach Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, and then generally I would be on on a plane Thursday or Friday until Sunday, and then come back to teach Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Wow. Now, of course, it would kind of change depending on uh what gigs i had on the weekend but what was a constant was my teaching schedule and then if i had because i do these big productions at berkeley um that are um that are uh collaborations between different departments so like dance department of course the musical department acting lights like these basically big productions reminiscent of the beyonce tour that I was on with different artists. And um, and so when I'm in that season, it's like I'm teaching full fledged, then I'm having these late night rehearsals until from like 6 p.m. until 12 a.m. And then sometimes, you know, I'll have to jump on a plane early the next morning, do my gigs, be a leader or a side woman, come back and and do that but it's yeah so i'm i'm really trying to be more mindful as to um the things that i want to take and really making sure that it it's i think every opportunity definitely breeds a new opportunity and every opportunity i've learned lessons from but i'm looking at everything else as to i want to make sure that i'm showing up um fully because many times i was so depleted and i i mean the standard was still relatively high, or at least I, I hope so, but I, I'd show up so depleted that I was always functioning on E wow. or, you know, mid. So, so just being more mindful so that I can maintain my health. And then of course my family, my mom and dad are both getting older. They're having health issues and I'm the mobile one in the family because my sister has children. So sometimes I got to jump and go and attend to them. Um, so just taking, looking at my full life as okay. I've been blessed in so many ways, which is which I'm so thankful for. But now, how can I be a blessing to others? Because essentially, that's what it comes down to. I've been blessed. We are. We've been blessed to be a blessing for others, and I'm really trying to look that throughout the totality of my life, while still maintaining. That's a that's a great way. That's a great way of looking at things. That really is. It's so positive, you know, and it's also it's giving. Um, mm -hmm. That's awesome. Now you mentioned all these productions and stuff and you mentioned Beyonce so I do have to I have to ask you know uh your experience 
with you know being with Beyonce for for a number of years what was that like for you how did you land that gig because people are going to want to know yeah yeah <laughs> so that experience was really transformational at that point in my career um I remember Prior to me getting that gig, I was I had just gotten signed to Mac Avenue Records, uh, the record label that I've been with for ooh, seven, 16 years now, 17 years, which is crazy. Um, and I was I was so this is the scope of the week between rehearsals, recording my first album for Mac Avenue and then getting the Beyonce gig Monday. I got actually was Sunday. I got it influx of emails and calls from people who were saying Beyonce's having auditions for all girl band you got it like everybody called me because at that point I was in New York and I was um, on the scene with my band which was cool so and meanwhile I was I was finishing up writing for my album that I was reporting in a couple of days and so Monday um, Monday basically was okay going to the audition for Beyonce um, but I didn't have time to really learn the music. So coming from a rehearsal that we had for my recording with my band, it was myself, Kim Thompson, I think it was Rachel Eckroth and um, Mimi Jones, uh, who was Miriam Sullivan back then. But we were rehearsing and then uh, we had pulled up the link of the song that we needed to learn for Beyonce's audition. So we literally listened to it maybe three or four times and it was her work it out song. And it was like, okay, I kind of got the hits there, but let's just go. <laughs> so we left um, a rehearsal studio in New York and then we went across town and we went to Sony Studios. And this was maybe around three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so I remember getting to Sony Studios, there was a long line going that, that circled around the block and down the block. I was like, there's no way I have time to stand in this line, but I want to get this audition in. So I strategically placed myself near the front of the line. I basically cut <laughs> and um, um, yeah, I, I went to the front of the line and then um, I remember waiting in line, I got in there within an hour or two and um, the musical director was like, okay, we're going to play Work It Out. I was like, okay. She was like, catch the hits where you can. And I was like, really? She was like, yeah, catch the hits where you can, but just solo. We want to hear you play. I was like, yes, okay. yes, I could do that. I can do that. <laughs> so went in there, Work It Out was over like a G minor vamp. I was like, this is cool. And I had so much pressure um, that I was kind of undergoing with writing that I took that moment just to kind of unleash and just play. Um, but prior to me walking in there, I remember I had this conversation with myself and I was like, should I play like Candy Dolfer, you know, David Sanborn or Najee? Like, I don't know what they want to hear. Maceo, they want to. And after that, upon me walking into the audition, I was like, I'm going to play Tia. I'm just going to do how, how, which was a great lesson for me. So then after that, um, that was Monday. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we were in the studio and it was Friday. We had just recorded our last song and, um, I got a call back and Kim Thompson got a call back and telling us that we made it or we did, we made the second call back, okay. uh, for Beyonce. Cause it started off, they went to five different States. It was like 5,000 girls. And then they narrowed it down with each call back. So I was like, Oh shoot. So we got the call back that evening. And I was so thankful because if they would have called any other time earlier that week, I wouldn't have been able to do it because I was recording my first album. So I was like, God, thank you. So then, then um, the next day we come back in, it was Saturday, Sony Studios, they had reduced it down to about maybe 400 girls and the way that they had configured different groups for us to play in. So we all played, we were there for eight hours. It was, it was kind of like a rat race, but we were in there for eight hours, just playing different configurations. We had to learn her new album, Deja Vu, that had just come out. And then I remember uh, we learned Deja Vu and she taught us some choreography. Then uh, this specific group of girls that I went in with, we were in this waiting room. And then um, 
Um, oh, I forgot a key component. I'm sorry this story is so long, but this is it. <laughs> no, this is really uh, interesting. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, so prior to me going in with one of the groups, like one of the silos, the groups, um, I remember Beyonce walking in. She was kind of late, so she, she hadn't heard everybody. She had on this white, it was like an all white outfit. She looked beautiful, no makeup on, and her hair was all back. She walked in, and then after that, it was a couple groups after that, my group went in and played. So then after that, we went into our waiting room, and the musical director came in, Kim Burst, and she was saying she was basically calling everybody's name that made it to the next tier and my name wasn't called and i was like oh shoot okay and so then kim came back and she said tia and i was like yeah she was like beyonce called for you and i was like are you serious so if it wasn't for her being in that callback i mean being in the room um and it was she had just stepped in the room a couple of minutes before we walked in there, then I wouldn't have gotten a call back. Wow. And so that was the second call back. And then the third day, they reduced it to about 100 girls, maybe 50. And, um, and the current, well, the band that they came up with, all of us were in there. And I remember it was Jay-Z, Beyonce, Miss Tina, her mom, her dad, all of her, you know, her entire crew, her stylist, Neil, Kelly Rowland was there. And when we all played together, and this was still the audition, um, it was Kim Thompson and Nikki Glassby both on drums, which was cool. Um, it was myself, Caddy, Divinity, Rie, like the band. So when we played, it was like everybody was having a party. That that whole her whole crew was standing up and like jamming out. And then after we did that, um, we went into the waiting room, and then Matthew Knowles came in and said, "You all made it." And I remember that was Father's Day 2006 because I called my dad and I said, Dad, happy Father's Day. I made it. <laughs> that is awesome. So, yeah, it was it was quite a bit. But let me tell you something, Donna. I realized how God is the ultimate orchestrator because if, if it were any other way, they could have called, you know, earlier that week and I wouldn't have been able to go back because I had studio time. And so I was just so thankful that it um, it panned out the way that it did as far as the scheduling of it. Yeah, but also oh, there's so many things in this. So <laughs> it was also your your attitude. You said I'm I'm, I'm going to do it. You know, you <laughs> didn't say oh, I don't know. I'm not sure. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you, you just went for it. Yeah, I did because I've always been in the mindset of if you just I've always been in the mindset of of if you're going to do something do it like if you're if you're going to do it even even though I, d I did not adequately prepare for the audition like i normally would just because i didn't have the space to but in my mind and again this is the law of attraction or but in my mind i'm thinking you know i was trying to be and still am but I was really focused on being the best musician that I possibly could. And I was doing everything within my power of practicing, of gigging. So this to me, if I were to get the gig, which I did, but it was an extension of all of those other works. Like the work had been done. Unfortunately, I didn't learn all the hits of the song, but I had been preparing for that moment for a long time to where the moment, I think there's a quote that says, um, success is when preparedness meets oh. oh preparedness meets um opportunity and i feel like that i had pre prepared myself to be able to step in a room and at least solo over a g minor vamp and kind of create something that was <laughs> that was exciting you know so but a high level of faith too because i was just like god if if this is for me work it out because there's a lot of stuff going on right now <laughs> yeah, there's a lot yeah. And um, yeah, so. The other thing too that struck me, you, you had that thought process of, okay, I'm not sure what they want. Do they want me to sound like Najee? Do they want me to sound like David Sanborn, Candy Dolph, or what do I do, what do I do? And then you said, no, I'm just gonna be Tia. That's it. We can only do as much as we can do. We can only sound as great as we 
can sound like, but to me, it's really taking that ownership over the moment and ownership over the preparedness, ownership over of just self really and, and tapping into the empowerment of, of self and resting into all of the transcriptions that I had done. The long tones and playing with um, um, a tuner, you know, a metronome, like all of these, <laughs> these tools that I've cultivated over the years and relinquishing or surrendering them to, okay, God, this is, you want my voice to come out because you bless me with this. And that, that brought a lot of peace. And as soon, as soon as I stopped thinking about myself in a sense of, oh God, I'm, I, I can't, or being nervous. And I started thinking of self regarding what I have to offer. Then it was like, okay. And actually beyond self and saying, I'm, I'm doing this. I, I read this quote where, why uh, Darren Hardy, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it's somebody else, um, another writer. But there's, they say how why is always the directive to what and how. Huh. And why, my why in that moment was to allow my voice to be heard and to take it as an opportunity to, um, to really <laughs> take it as an opportunity to um, kind of shed some of the stress that I had. <laughs> To <laughs> trying to write all week, really. I was like, this is an opportunity. I want to redirect all the stress and anxiety. I want to move this through the, my my instrument. So at that point, Candy Dolfer, John, you know, John Coltrane, whoever, I was like, I just got to kind of play my spirit. Now, I got to ask another question with regard to that. So for this particular experience, that's what you know you you came to that conclusion you tapped into that were there experiences before then or even after then where you know whether it's an audition or or a performance or uh, um even like i'll even say a jam session a lot of times we go you know like let's say to a jam session you know high level jam session stuff like that and you know there's there's always that element of you know am i keeping up you know am i you know what i'm yeah. saying so it's, I'm trying to get to like the, the, the thought process here. Cause I know a lot of people always have these questions regarding, oh my gosh, you know, I got to sound hip. I've got to sound cool, you know, but they're not tapping into themselves. You know what I mean? So like when you, you know, and you're into those kinds of situations, aside from the one we just mentioned, you know, were those types of thoughts going through your head or were you always just like, you know, I'm going to trust on faith that, you know, all the stuff that I've done is going to, you know, uh, make me you know, keep up, so to speak. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not always. And still to this day, if I were to be completely honest, that still creeps in my, my mind as to, oh, I'm trying to keep up. Oh, I'm sounding good enough. Uh, it's really like, we just did a concert with the sax loft with Jeff Coffin and Kirk Whalum. And, you know, they're like, oh, you sound great. And in the back of my head, I'm like, oh my God, you know, Ugh, I'm not sounding good. But in the, I mean, other examples of that, like, especially during that time when I was with Beyonce is um, Cecil Brooks III had a had a jazz club that all of us would hang out at, and it was called Cecil's. And I remember strategically, like, being in the jazz club, and there was always jam sessions on Tuesday nights, and there would always be these killing musicians, saxophonists, like Bruce Williams was one of them, Freddie Hendrick, Sean Jones, uh, Mark Gross. And I remember specifically placing myself behind whoever had the like the most exciting solo because it it caused me and I realized that it was I was forcing myself to really play up and um, and to also deal with the whole transmutation of the thoughts that you're thinking like oh my god I'm scared oh my god. I don't sound good. I'm not as good as that. Oh, I can't like all of that. I had to overcome, even though, and I'm not, I'm still not a master of it, but I feel like that I have enough tools in place and, and enough affirmations to be able to get me to the stage and for me to get to who I am, the, the, 
the core and the nuance of, of my spirit and what I'm trying to convey. Um, but it was, you know, certain strategic things like that that I, I would do. And I mean, it still happens. I still get freaked out sometimes when I play games with Terry Lynn Carrington or if somebody's in the audience. But I have to go through this process of either saying affirmation, greater is he within me than he within the world. Um, you know, death and life, the power of his tongue, start speaking things into existence and really really moving myself through that in a healthy way so that we're not in this self-deprecation of um, mode that that you start off here and then you just keep digging a hole for yourself. This is so powerful. And, and, and thank you for, for being vulnerable and sharing that because a lot of people tend to think, oh, when a person's at a certain level, you know, they don't have those types of feelings, you know, they're, they're, they're fine, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. But it's, you know, I, I can almost guarantee to say like there's so many people that feel the same way, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, most recently, um, the Pixar soul thing that I was a part of, I remember being in the studio and the music wasn't that hard, but I remember playing and freaking myself out, like going again through these thoughts of, oh, my God. All of the executives, the Pixar executives are in the control booth right now listening to us play. And this is going to be on a major film, like a cartoon for, you know, a monumental character that I'm playing the sax for. Dorothea. So all of these things I was really magnifying in my brain. And um, then I had to, I remember, I remember I was in the booth. I was like freaking out internally. And then I brought myself down. I was like, Tia, just play you. Just play, tap into your spirit. That was it. And uh, yeah, and so it's it's definitely it's a process. It's a process. But but to me, what has helped me is to truly think about the purpose. Like not not the purpose in that moment, maybe, but essentially, what is my purpose? And my purpose, I realized, and I kind of realized this early on, is to be is to be a light for others, whether it be in the classroom, whether it be on the bandstand, whether it be through my music, whether it be with my family, like how can I try to be the light for others? And once I redirect my brain to my purpose, I'm like, okay, here we go. Bring it in girl. All right, you got this. <laughs> yeah, and you know, the funny thing every time, so with the Beyonce audition, with soul with with playing the music there you came back to i gotta be me that's it that's, that's it that's really cool that's really cool yeah. I, I i was gonna ask you how did you how did you land that that gig with soul um i got a, i got a call i think so i got a call um from randall kennedy at um Ted Curlin agency, and which is a booking agency. And they said that they were looking for someone who is a black woman and played the saxophone to play this character, Dorothea Will Williams. And he specifically said, she's a badass. She's um, She has her own band in New York. Um, she, you know, kind of has an attitude, but everybody wants to be in her band. She's like, she was the it thing in, in New York. And I was like, this is really kill. Cool. Just the whole concept of having a black woman as a character, a Pixar character at that, playing the saxophone and then having such a powerful role. Uh, so of course I said, yes, I, I, so in particular to be, transparent once again i am um, i had another gig that i had scheduled and so i was like i need to make sure that i can get out of this other gig and thank god because i had already signed the contract but thank god the individual he was very understanding and he moved some stuff around um so yeah that was that's how i initially got it and then i got there um i spoke prior to that i spoke to the um musical director or artistic musical director with Pixar, Tom McDougal. And we had a conversation, he was really nice. Everybody at Pixar is just so sweet. And he was like, yeah, we, we're excited to have you. We we're working out the logistics. And then he told me everybody in the band. And I was like, what, you're gonna get Roy Haynes? Oh, I definitely got to do this. That Marcus Gilmore, Linda O, John Baptiste is a musical director. Um, 
And then from there, they sent me my ticket and flew out there. Um, we, we set up our booths and they set up all the cameras and there was a camera, there were like three different cameras, one on my face, one on my body and one on my fingers. And I had asked the guy, I was like, this camera's going on my fingers? He was like, oh yeah, every single fingering that you play, you're gonna see her playing. It's not just like, you know, people. So if I was playing a D, you would see her finger a D. So that's one of the extraordinary things about Pixar. But yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And um, again, it was, it was a blessing. It was really a blessing to, to be a part of that project. And especially now with uh, Black Lives Matter yeah. and, you know, and these, uh, our young girls seeing women playing male dominated instruments that have been portrayed throughout the history of jazz. And then we're seeing our young black girls and girls of color with your know, multicultural, you have Linda O, oh, you have the trombone player, you have myself. It's like, I can do this. And they're singing at a very young age. So this will be the last story regarding this, but it was Christmas time when it, when it released, when it came out, it was actually on Christmas day. And I was in Atlanta with my best friend and my little niece. Um, my little play niece, and she is she's like four or five years old, and she was like, Auntie Tia, that's you? I was like, yeah. She was like, can you take the saxophone out now? So just her association to the saxophone, of her being able to play it, there was no sort of question behind it. I pulled it out, I played it, and then she blew into it for a moment, and she was like, can you play the saxophone? So I was showing her different songs and played some uh, Christmas carols. But her association to the saxophone is, or any instrument is, I can do this because she saw it in a cartoon form. And her auntie, you know, and her auntie would have no other choice because I sent her a saxophone for Christmas. <laughs> so, <laughs> a little That's play awesome. toy. Yeah. I'm just thinking about all the role model that you were, are, right? Just based, just even that one role, but Beyonce, all the other stuff, but just that one role the role model that you were um, for many young girls. Hmm. Think of that impact. It, it's really, uh, I mean, I, I don't even know what to say. It's kind of overwhelming when I think of it. Um, I'm just thankful because I come from a lineage of strong women and um, intentional women, prayerful women and even teaching at Berkeley, like it's it's always been a passion of mine. And of course I, I treat all of my students the same, but I, I understand the struggle that being a woman and a black woman in a male dominated industry has been. And so I really try to lend a helping hand and open my doors to all of my young ladies and give them affirmations and have conversations, honest conversations about what they're dealing with on every tier. The ironic thing, it's not just, it's not just being a musician, but like I have a student and she's, um, I have a Rihanna ensemble at Berkeley and she's like the, um, one of the vocalists, but she's also mm -hmm. the managing director. So she's like pr the production manager and she's extraordinary. She like, she has all of the skill sets. And so having conversations with her, I was like, I really want to take her more under my wing and give her whatever I have. So I actually, just last week, um, I just signed her up to be my assistant, my personal assistant to help booking gigs and things like that. So she could kind of get her teeth, you know, her fingers wet into that. But just really, again, I'm blessed to be a blessing of a, to, for others when I can, you know. Yeah. With a bleeding self, of course. <laughs> yeah, no, but. no, this is great. No, and, and it's, it's that, that whole giving back thing. Um, and now I'm, I'm going to take a left turn because I'm curious about, you mentioned a couple of times, you know, you've worked on the tools to be mm -hmm. able to do what you're doing. So can you, um, let's, let's talk about in terms of like maybe developing your technique or developing your improvisation and stuff. You know, we talked about the Oliver Nelson book and that kind of thing. But when you're, when you're improvising, you know, like maybe when you first started improvising to like, you know, how you approach improvisation now, what's, what's your, 
I don't know how to word this. Like, what's your approach? You know, are you thinking like Berkeley is all about like uh, mostly chord scales and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. um, like, what's your approach when it comes to improv improvisation now? And what was it when you were first starting? Mm, that's good. Um, oh, shoot. Um, I have about maybe five or 10 more minutes. I was just looking at the time. <laughs> I'm sorry. But oh, no, it's fine. Um, so when I went to Spelman College, I was studying under Joe Jennings, who was my teacher. Um, and he is like my second father. Being a product of Spelman, it's a historically black college. There weren't a lot of, I was like one of the only two jazz majors or music majors with the jazz emphasis. So I'm saying that to say um, my, my approach is probably a little different. So mm -hmm. my teacher, he gave me a lot of my foundation, Joe Jennings. And, um, and back then I felt like I was just trying to get as much language as possible. So uh, like my freshman year, I remember, I, I mean, I had a, a practice journal um, and I remember talking with Victor Goins um, at El Chapultepec when I was in Colorado, it's like a jazz club in Colorado when I was about 18 or 19, he was like, make sure that you're practicing encompasses five, diff five different levels, like the five basic food groups you get your nourishment. And I was like, oh, I like this. So he was like, um, make sure it's long tones, you know, sound, um, scales, uh, like major scales, minor scales, diminished scales, patterns, learning tunes, and transcribing. And so for the longest time, that was my regimen of daily, I would map out hour by hour an itemized list as to what I was doing um, and then I would check those off. But early on, that's what it was. It was scales. It was a lot of scales and patterns. Um, but then I worked on uh, transcribing and then playing over tunes. Later, because now that my schedule and even earlier, my schedule has become a little more involved and it, it can't be as regimented because of traveling, um, there would be like maybe an idea that I, I work on um, and that I would either take through the keys or, or really try to play through the sound of the idea, especially if I'm listening to somebody like a new artist and just trying to get into the, like Joe Lovano. Um, I actually wrote a tune based off of one of his ideas. That's another way that I try to uh, internalize information, but writing songs in honor of other folks. Um, but so yeah, taking an idea and then taking it through the keys, that's more, that's, to me, more of an elevated version of playing patterns or uh, scales is because you have this sound, this major scale sound, but here's an idea that you can play over that and then doing different variations of that. And, um, and then, and I didn't start doing this last part until um, probably a couple of years ago is that really isolating my practice and making sure that I'm creating um, the application portion of my practice, meaning that I'm not just siloing these major scales or this pattern, but I'm actually now going to practice applying it over a tune in different variations. And I don't know why, but when I was an undergrad, I wasn't doing that. I was going and sitting in and working on certain things, but that application thing, I didn't really, it, it didn't really process uh, for me until later in life, until I was doing it naturally, but now the, the application or just getting to the instrument and then trying to play off of the sound, you know, a color or a shape or, so yeah. That, that's what I'm dealing with now, I would say, is just getting to my instrument. I mean, I'll still play long tones if I have time, but I think most importantly is just trying to get to the sound and work through certain shapes and melodies within the scope of a tune. Okay, this is, and this ideas. is gold. This is gold because I was going <laughs> to, no, this is absolute gold. And let me ask you one, one final question before we go. Sure. Um, what has been one tool that you would say that you used and you know we often ask like a tool that's under a hundred dollars or something like that but um like what's one tool that's really helped you to do that to uh, add the application that's a good question you know i mean initially what i was going to say before i heard the rest of is rhythm and i know this is a non-traditional tool it's not like a jamie abershald or you know a book or method book but to me I was just laughing with uh, Chris 
<laughs> I'm sorry, Kirk Whalem and Jeff Coffin, because Jeff had this tune in 17. And I was like, I'm still working on playing in 17 from that tune. He's like, oh, T I was like, no, I couldn't dance to it. That was the issue. I couldn't dance to it because it was lopsided to me and I couldn't find my dance. And ironically enough, I realized that if the tool for me has always been in order for me to move through something um, in a rhythmic element and really to me, rhythm is more important, not more, but is equally as important as harmony. If it, and sometimes it's more important in a, in a sense that it, that if your rhythm, if you're anchored and your rhythm is anchored, then you could essentially do anything rhythmically, especially if you're you're taking something through a motif or an idea. So yeah, my tool I would say is, is rhythm. I approach playing, I think more like a drummer probably in most cases. Um, and hence the reason why I love playing with drummers. Um, to me, the drummer is the one of the most important parts of my band is making sure that there is interaction between uh, the drummer and I. So yeah, my tool is rhythm. That's a great question. You know, what's interesting too, you had said uh, back in high school, you you were a woodwind person that went to the drum line. And yeah. I'm wondering how much that experience has shaped you. I think I think it really has between playing drums and then my dad being a bass player, I always start from a bass line generally when I'm writing. I was gonna ask so you. between, it's always that kind of the core element. It's sometimes I'll start from a melody, but in most cases it'll be bass line or some sort of rhythm that's happening within the bass line. So yeah, my tool is definitely rhythm. So that that's, is, that is it's so also a weakness. Cause if I can't find the dance, then I'm, <laughs> <laughs> it's like what oh god i need to find some sort of you know in order to navigate through it melodically <laughs> oh my god that's 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 awesome that's gold and listen thank you i know we spent a little extra time here i really appreciate your time there's so many other questions i had to ask you oh. so i've got to find another time that we okay do this again because um man you shared some gold golden mindset tips and those stories were amazing and just rhythm no one's on the podcast has ever said that before. Oh. And I think that's going to really resonate with people for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me, Donna.